everybody. We are so glad that you're joining us for our third part of the series, Blame Throwers. I am honored to be here with my son. What a privilege to be here with Pastor Devin. And we're gonna finish up today, the third part. So with the, just to recap, the first week we talked about relationship with others and blame throwers. And then, sorry, we talked about relationship, he talked about relationship with myself. And then I talked about last week, relationship with others. And today we're gonna to talk about relationship with friends and family, mostly family, but there's some friends that are like close like family. And we're gonna talk about what happens when that's toxic. Uh, really excited because how many have been enjoying the Blame Thrower series thus far? Hey, let's throw it in the chat. I need you guys to throw out your greatest lesson or one of your biggest takeaways for what you've learned thus far. I thought you did an awesome job last week, Mom. Thanks. Just through toxic relationships. Because um, that's something that is a reality for so many of us. We have toxic relationships. And we want to give a little bit more practical handles on how to handle those today. And really, I, I'm going to kind of get ahead of ourselves a little bit already. But really, it's in the area of our family. And just because somebody is blood, write this down. Just because somebody is blood doesn't mean it isn't bad blood. Don't make me sing Taylor Swift. <laughs> bad blood, you know. Okay. Uh, now we got bad blood. <laughs> we gotta. We gotta. I don't know the words, we gotta but... be professional about this. <laughs> okay. So blame throwers part three. The first week was about relationship with yourself, really taking responsibility. Like mom said, relationship with others, toxic relationships. This week, we really want to talk about relationships with family. Now we're gonna dive into a story, and actually, this sermon is gonna be a little different than normal. Uh, because one, we have two people. A right. second one is we're really going to just tell the story of a family that everybody knows very well. But this story is packed with just craziness. So much in it. Chaos. So much. Uh, insubordination, insurrection. You could go through a different... Murders, uh, killings. Tons of different things. Of, like all kinds of evil. But we want to do a deep dive on the family of David. Now, I'm going to highlight two verses, and I want to read this for you first real quick. Second Samuel chapter 19, verse 5, it says this. Then Joab went into the house... To the king, and he said, Today you have humiliated all of your men who have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines. Now, pause for a second. Some scripture is descriptive, some scripture is prescriptive. We are not declaring at Connect Church that you should have multiple wives and concubines. That is not no. what we affirm here, okay? Just make it very clear. I know there's maybe a husband that's like, yo, this church is crazy. <laughs> I don't know why you'd no. want more than one wife, right, Lord men? knows you can only handle one. Uh... Moving on, moving on. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I'm going to get into a word. <laughs> okay, so uh, you say the lives of your sons, your daughters, and the lives of your wives and your concubines. And then Joab says this to David, you love those who hate you, and you hate those who love you. We're going to break this down in a minute. And you've made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. So Joab says to David, I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, I don't have much of the context. We're going to help you in that context of that story for a second. But we want to be brief, we want to break it down. But first, let me tell you a quick little story. Before that, I'll pray. Father, we thank you. We ask that your spirit would speak through us. Yes. Um, Father, for all those that are engaging online today and in our final installment of Blame Throwers, I think this is an imperative series. And so help us to properly, adequately, and clearly communicate what you have for us to communicate today. Help us to receive the word with humility, that it would be uh, dug deep down into our souls, that it would produce good fruit. Help us to properly put boundaries in place so all of us can be able to navigate life relationally in a healthy manner. Help us to win in relationships, to also live in peace. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Right now, uh, my wife and I, we're actually sleep training Ezra. Ezra is our second born. Uh, Zion is our first born. And so my wife is actually sleeping in Zion and Ezra's room. They, they share two beds in one room. But we can't have them sleep in the same room together right now, obviously because Ezra is sleep training. He'll wake up in the middle of the night. And the last thing we would want, Mom, you know this, the last thing we would want is both of our kids to be up at 3 o'clock in the morning when we're trying to sleep and we have energy. Now listen, for some of the young parents out there, we are praying for you. I am, I am starting to see the horizon and hope in the distance. As I'm starting to be able to sleep again, praise the living lamb of Jesus yes, Christ. sleep is good for early young parents. So, <laughs> so necessary. But right now, uh, Natalia is sleeping in Ezra's room. She's sleep training Ezra. I am sleeping with Z, and Z's sleeping in my room. So we have this special bed set up in our room. I'm sleeping in our bed. Honestly, I'm sleeping like a king right now. I'm very grateful for my wife. She's the best. There's one particular night I had this idea. 
I have this idea because we've never done this before, other than maybe once or twice because we were traveling. But I was like, you know what? I want to sleep with Z. I would love to have just a snuggle buddy. I, I love my son to death. And so I just decided, you know what, Z, why don't you come in my bed and you can sleep with daddy in the night? And so I was just thinking to myself, this would be cool. I love to just cuddle with my little boy. I love him so much. Four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Four o'clock in the morning rolls around. Zion, first of all, is upside down. Like his head was not on the pillow. His head was by my feet. His feet were in my face. It was the worst night of sleep I've ever gotten. What turned, what, what I thought would be a good idea turned out to be a terrible idea. It's like sleeping with a bucking bronco. It was horrible. This kid kept <laughs> slapping me in the face. He woke me up at 6.30. Daddy, daddy, are you awake? Daddy, can I have daddy's phone? Daddy, daddy. And I'm like, dude, I'm never doing this again. I'm never doing it again. Like, I'll, you know, maybe have a nap with him one day, but I'm not sleeping through the night with him again because he's waking me up early, he's taking my peace, and he's taking my rest. Here's why I say this. Because we have some relationships in our lives, and they can be blood, they can be family, but anybody that's taking your peace, anybody that's taking your rest, you have to do a few different things. You would either have to be present with them, be distant with them, or last one, Mom, be, be absent, absent with from them. them. And so some of us need to learn how to properly identify and discern the relationships in our lives, including family, by the way. Come on. And either distance ourselves or say, hey, Z, you're going in a different room and daddy's <laughs> sleeping in this room. We because are defining if, this relationship and you're not sleeping in this bed. <laughs> it is so important. And listen, you can love people, but you can love people from a distance. Absolutely. And I know this is kind of a funny story, but for so many of us, there is family drama and family issues, and I'll say it again. Just because somebody shares your blood doesn't mean it couldn't be bad blood. That's right. So we have to properly align and define our relationships, specifically with our relationships with toxic people, but even relationships with family. Yes. It is so important. And I feel like the church, Mom, I feel like people are so undertaught or not taught at all on this subject. Yeah. And so that's why we want to give this today. So this will be nuanced. This will be unique. And there will be some novelty ideas in here that you'll probably be like, what? I've never heard that before. We want to show you it's incredibly biblical. Absolutely. But in Scripture, what happens a lot of times is we'll see all throughout the narrative of Scripture, there's really not one ideal healthy family. We really learn in Scripture from stories and families of what not to do. Yeah, and we're going to talk today about a really jacked up family. So this might make you feel better about yours. <laughs> um, that's what we're here for, some encouragement along the way. But let me. I'm going to start with the backstory um, before the verse that Devin read at the beginning. So we're in chapter 19 is what we read earlier. Mm -hmm. Mom's going to give you the first few chapters because really the story of 2 Samuel, the book of 2 Samuel can be chapter and characterized in two different ways. The first one will be David's triumphs versus really 1 through 10, chapters 1 through 10. And chapters 11 through like 20 is David's trials or troubles. And we find ourselves in the story of Absalom, David's third born son. And I'll get mom to tell this part of the story. Absalom, and then we find ourselves with David later on in the story. But first, here's a question because this is what we were just talking about earlier. How many of us got not 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 baby drama? How many got family drama? <laughs> I think a lot of us, if you took inventory of our families, we would be like, yeah, there's some family division, there's some family drama. Let's talk about probably the biggest family drama story in all of Scripture. Go yeah. Ahead. Okay. So here's uh, the backstory on that verse is. Absalom, like, like Devin mentioned, is David's third-born son. Well, his first-born son, David's first-born son, was Amnon. So Amnon, basically they, there was this tragic event that Amnon raped his half-sister Tamar. Okay, so Absalom comes... Drama. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hello. Good. You should already feel better about your own family. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, the, the spirit of Absalom, I'm going to give you the nutshell of what Absalom means, but we're going to look back at why he is that way. All of a sudden, he turned in that, into this conniving, crafty, manipulative, um, almost narcissistic kind of behavior. And, and, and an Absalom spirit, it means you have a corrupt heart. Okay, we talked about that last week with evil people. Absalom's spirit would be considered an evil kind of behavior. So if this rape happens. Well, Absalom takes his half-sister in, um, Tamar. And he keeps her for two years. But what happens is this seed of bitterness starts festering in him for two years. So finally, he figures out a way that he's going to lure and manipulate Amnon and all of his brothers and his father. He invites his father as well to this sheep shearing event. Woohoo! What a party. Sheep shearing event. Okay. But what happens, long story short, is Absalom in that moment ha has already planned this scheme. And he gets his people, his servants, to kill his brother Amnon, the one that had raped his sister. 
Well, what happens is that David gets so upset and he banishes Absalom from the kingdom and he sends him away. But here's what happened is David didn't handle the toxicity and the sin in the first place when his oldest son raped his daughter. So he left toxicity, just unrighteous behavior. He just left it there and did nothing with it. Talk about a passive man. But he, he basically, um, he let that toxicity fester there just because he was family. Just because Amnon was the firstborn son, probably in line for the king or for the, for the kingdom for, and to be the throne, on the throne. He basically just left it so that it just festered. And then it caused great turmoil in the kingdom. So fast forward, um, Absalom is out of the kingdom for three years. And during that three years, he starts thinking, I can do this better. I can be a better king than my own father. I can do this better. He manipulates his way back into the kingdom where David is. And um, at that time, Israel was divided. So um, he, he's back into David's presence. And then he starts manipulating people and endearing people to himself. And a civil war ensues where Absalom is trying to take over the whole kingdom from his father. So they're in the civil war. And then David, um, David's men have Absalom on the run. And Absalom, basically his hair, he had a massive head of hair, beautiful apparently, head of hair, and it gets caught in this tree branch. So he's dangling there. It says his mule ran off. I don't know why you're in a, in a fight with a mule, but that's a whole different story. So his hair gets caught in the tree branch and he's dangling there. And then David's men come back and kill him. Okay, so I'm going to let Devin take over from there. So David's men kill Absalom against David's request, by the way. Yes. So let me do a deep dive real quick, because this is just through my own personal study. Uh, so many people have asked throughout Scripture, and scholars have been like, why was David so passive? We know him as a warrior king. As a matter of fact, we did a series called Warrior King years ago. Go back mm -hmm. on YouTube and watch that. But we know David is a warrior king. He's a fierce leader. He's an incredible leader. Matter of fact, Scripture defines him as a man after God's, God's own, own heart. heart. Mm -hmm. Yet, David was an incredible leader, but he was a terrible father. Terrible father. And some people would say the reason he was a bad father was because he didn't have a father in the first place. And he subjected himself to King Saul's leadership and was willing to take on all of Saul's toxicity, all right. of Saul's uh, issues, and throwing spears at him and his horrible relationship because that was the closest thing to fathering that, that David ever ever seen. We see this because you remember when Samuel approached, you remember this mom? Samuel approached, Samuel was the prophet that approached David. And so he approaches uh, David's family, Jesse, the father, and all these sons line up. They say, they see Elliot. They see all these sharp, good-looking, strong men. And Samuel's like, surely this is the king to Israel. Nope. Surely this is the king. Nope, 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 nope. David wasn't even represented. We find later in Scripture, I believe it's in Psalms, David said, I was born into iniquity. So we know that there was probably some issue between Jesse and David, that maybe Jesse wasn't his, maybe he was his blood father, but maybe he was a half. Maybe there was some kind of family dynamic that was just a tough struggle for David. And so David clearly had some family trauma and it's family issues that issues. he never, ever addressed. Right. And so maybe that's where his passivity came from. That's what many scholars believe. His passivity came from the fact that he had a father issue. He had a father wound. And now we see, because he did not take care of his heart, Pastor Emmy Vasquez, he says this, heart work is hard work. So because David did not take care of his heart, the warrior king was a bad dad. So he did not address the issues that were in Absalom. And so really what happened was there was a two-year period where David removed himself from Absalom. They did not talk. And in that time of distance, what happened to Absalom? Bitterness grew. And then he became an insurrectionist. He became a liar. He became a cheater, a murderer. And he essentially divided the nation of Israel into a separate kingdom. He was manipulating himself. He was manipulating other people. And eventually the nation divided. And so now David was removed from the palace. He was removed from the kingdom. And you either had to be on Absalom's side or David's side. We find ourselves getting right into chapter 18 right here. And chapter 19, I'm, I'm sorry. And so finally, Absalom was defeated. He was destroyed. and He was eventually killed. And so what was supposed to be a victory for the kingdom 
was actually a defeat because of how David, David handled it. Mm-hmm. Joab went into the house. By the way, he, it says he went into the house. So Joab did not, pri- did not publicly confront David. He privately did it. Whenever you have tough conversations, you publicly protect and what? You privately, privately confront. Yeah. You publicly protect, you privately confront. So Joab did the right thing. He privately went to David and he said, David, what are you doing? What are you doing? Today, you've humiliated all of your men. All these men, by the way, just saved your life. They saved your son's lives, your daughter's lives, your wives, your people, your family, your influence, your kingdom, your throne. They saved, they put all their lives on the line and they risked it. And now that Absalom, who is your enemy, even though he's your son and he was your blood, he was really your enemy. He was dividing the nation against you. He wanted you killed. And he said, you treat them, you treat your son, who is really uh, your enemy, as your ally, and you treat us, who is really your ally, as your enemies. He says, you love those who hate you, and you hate those who love you. I see you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. I think the grave mistake, now listen to me, this is really the point, and this is what we want to get into. I think the grave mistake that David made was he didn't see Absalom for who he was. He saw him for who he wanted him to be. He saw his potential, but he did not see who Absalom currently was. Now, here's what I'm not saying, and I think we need to make this qualify. We're not saying that your rebellious son or, you know, some of the issues that you may be facing in your family, that you need to distance yourself or kill them. That's not what we're saying at all. This was an extreme story. Uh, I'm pretty sure none of you have a son or a daughter or a family member that's literally trying to murder you in your sleep, take over your kingdom and all that. This is an extreme story. But the principle remains. Mm -hmm. For all of our relationships, including family, listen, just because they're family doesn't mean they're a friend. That's right. Oh my gosh, that's good, Mom. That is good. That wasn't even in my notes. (laughs) Just because they're a family doesn't mean they're a friend. And so we have to take people for who they are not just who we wish they would be. And there's something to be said for believing the best in somebody, but when you have a pattern that is over basically a lifetime or just months and years of a pattern of toxic behavior, that's when you know you shouldn't just be believing the best in them. It's you've got to confront some behavior. Totally. And this is why you have to learn the distinction between judgment and discernment. There's actually good judgment, Scripture says. So judgment is not wrong in and of itself, but judgment, really condemnation is wrong. But good judgment is really what we call discernment. I did a series, I I did this whole um, sermon, it's called Pharisee University. Go back on YouTube and watch that that, uh, sermon. But we have to make sure we properly discerning our relationships to align and define our relationships. Essentially, this whole series is trying to accomplish one thing, that you would fundamentally look at your relationships in a different way. That we have to decide who to be present with, who to be distant from, or who to be completely removed from and absent from. I remember hearing this quick little illustration. It's basically, if you get a knock on your door, somebody knocks on your door, you have to discern through the information that you have, who, whether you shut the door, whether you let them into the living room, or you let them sit at your dining room table. It's, it's basically a distance conversation. It's a, it's a distancing conversation. It's not that you can't love people. You can love everybody. You can pray for everybody. You can cover their weaknesses. You can cover their mistakes. You cannot give everybody time. Right. You can't. So you have to learn how to either be present, distant, or absent from people. And ultimately, what mom and I want to do, hopefully set this up for you properly. Hopefully, you're in the same kind of place. If you're tracking, throw it in the chat. You'd be like, this is a really good story. I need, I need this information. I need to know what to do because we want to give you four handles on what to do. And we want to function as Joab in this moment where we can sit you down right. privately. We're having a private conversation between you and yourself, not anybody else. But we need you to properly align and define your relationship. So we're going to be Joab. Sit you down privately and say, David, friend, family member, your kingdom you're, not, you're, you're going to lose a lot more than just mm-hmm. a son right now. You, right. We need to put some reality into this situation. So how do you properly align and define your relationships? Here are four areas where you need to discern. Mom, give me number one. Number one is advocation. Advocation. Okay. Write that down. Throw it in the chat. I need to see it in big, bold letters. Advocation. Advocate. 
advocate for yourself. So here's the thing, here's a verse right here. Ephesians 4.3, this is how you're gonna steward your life. Ephesians 4.3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. If you don't have peace in relationships, that should tell you something. That should tell you, number one, that you've gotta advocate for yourself, and then you're gonna go through steps one through four. But to advocate, basically, you know, when I think of an ad, the advocate, I think of the Holy Spirit, it says, you know, um, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and he will advocate for us. Well, we have to advocate for ourselves when we don't have peace. And I, a lot of times we feel so bad or we, um, someone else's behavior or what we think their behavior is gonna look like dictates whether we confront them. That should tell you that you're not advocating for yourself. We need to stop feeling bad about unhealthy people's unhealthy behaviors based off of my healthy decisions. Mm. Did you get that? That's good, Mom. You, you, we've gotta stop feeling bad about unhealthy people having unhealthy behaviors and reactions to my healthy decisions. That's good. You've gotta advocate for yourself. You advocate for your peace, you advocate for your mental health, and it's only up to you. It's not up to them. Remember, we said I'm responsible for my behavior, I'm not responsible for theirs. So, advocation is the first step. I think it's so good. I think you also have to realize and recognize because I think this is where people are not taught. So you have to recognize that is advocating for yourself is not being selfish. That's being a good steward. Right, absolutely. God gave us a calling, he gave us an assignment, he gave us vision for our life. And so ultimately, if you are susceptible to everybody else's vision, calling, time, schedule, uh, values, you will eventually not have a life for yourself. And so God has called you to be ridiculously responsible, as Dr. Henry Cloud said, to be ridiculously responsible for your life. That is good stewardship. I wrote down like a few relational myths just to kind of get it out of the way. Because I think sometimes we can utilize scripture or think in scripture something means something, but it means a completely different thing. Here's one thing I just wrote down. Um, turning the other cheek. We hear this scripture a lot. Is you know, you got to turn the other cheek. And what we oftentimes uh, correlate that with is being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. That is not what the scripture is teaching. Jesus is really telling people, don't retaliate. It doesn't mean to be taken advantage of. Right. Read it again. Go back in the scriptures. Go back in the gospels and identify yourself. It is to say the way we handle uh, negativity, the way we handle shame, and the way we handle guilt and being taken advantage of is we just don't retaliate. Right. That is what the scripture teaches. It doesn't mean to be taken advantage of. And sometimes it might mean turn the other cheek and then keep going in that direction. <laughs> and, and move and remove keep yourself moving. completely. Keep moving. <laughs> Here's another one I wrote down. Is relational removals means I'm being selfish. No it means you're being a good steward of your life. Yeah. It means you're taking care of your family. It means you're taking care of your heart. Guard your heart is what scripture teaches. Totally. Be careful. And so we talked about week one. Remember, we had six different areas of responsibility, verbally, emotionally, spiritually, generationally. We have to guard those areas. And so relational removals is not being unloving. It's being loving towards yourself, your family, and your future. Absolutely. And then the last thing I just wrote down was this. Do you have something to say? You want to say something? No, that's okay. Go ahead. The last thing I was going to say is this, is that my feelings should be ignored with my relationships. Your feelings should not lead your relationships, but your feelings are an indicator of how your relationships are doing. Right. And so here's what that means. Basically in a car, if you have a gauge that says, hey, check engine oil light, your emotions are a gauge. They're not a guy, they're, they're a gauge. They're showcasing something's wrong. There's a tension inside of this relationship that needs my attention. And so don't ignore those feelings. If you get around somebody, and you just don't want to be around them, you should ask yourself, why do I not want to be around them? And so maybe your emotions are telling you, hey, they need to be removed or distanced or there needs to be a conversation that happens. That is what being an advocate for your life is all about. Right. That's good. Keep going? Okay. Yeah, keep going with conversation. So number one is advocation. Number two, conversation. So how do you discern whether it be present, distant, or absent? Advocation, advocate for yourself. Number two, conversation. Here's what I wrote down. Some people are prayers. What I mean by that is intercessors. They're, they're prayer people. Some people are prayer people. Some people are answers to prayers. And some people are the reason why we pray. <laughs> That's so true. Some people are like, I just need, God, help me to deal with this person. I know I'm talking to somebody. Don't put their name in the chat. Don't do Don't it. Don't elbow. Don't do it. <laughs> but some people are the reason why we pray. And some people are answers to prayers. Thank God for the people that God sends in our lives that are really blessings. Yes. But that's why I think it's so important that we need to align and define our relationships. And this is what I say to my five waiters all the time. I've taught this for years. Dating is for data. Essentially, the reason you date is to collect information about the person so that you can make a wise choice and hear from God. 
essentially what the, what the uh, underneath that principle is that conversation is for information. Write that down. Conversation is for information. When you have conversations, you get to identify uh, people's beliefs. You get to right. identify people's patterns and behaviors. And I read this book. It was called People Fueled by Dr. Henry Cloud. Incredible book and John, Dr. Town, John Townsend. Um, he gives seven kinds of relationships. I'm going to roll through these really fast. Uh, go back, read that book. I'd highly recommend it. But he basically says there's seven kinds of relationships. There are coaches. These people have an expertise in an area. There are comrades. These are people that challenge you and are also vulnerable with you. These are like best friends. These are covenant relationships. That's a David and Jonathan type of relationship. Mm -hmm. There are casuals. These people have low commitments. They're low commitment relationships, but they're very enjoyable. It's like a farm team. These people can eventually turn into comrades, but it takes testing. There are colleagues. These are our work relationships. There are care relationships where you are providing good to those who are without good. And so this is where the, the maybe narrative shifts a little bit. When we start going into care relationships, we have to identify are they care relationships or number six, are they chronic relationships? A chronic relationship is a relationship that has no observable improvement over time. I hope this is connecting with you. Chronic relationships have no observable improvement over time. And then there are contaminant relationships. And these types of relationships are people that seek harm to other people. Take those notes down, write down those seven relationships, but that's what conversation will reveal. Conversation will reveal if somebody is a casual. Conversation will reveal if somebody is a covenant kind of relationship or a comrade. Mm -hmm. Conversation will reveal if somebody is chronically uh, not growing or not improving. Because again, this is not a conversation about whether I love them or not. This is a conversation about whether they deserve my time or not. Blame throwers is all about that. You can't start throwing blame at other people because you are ridiculously responsible and a steward of your own life. Just because I'm a language kind of guy, I care for words and maybe just kind of giving you pictures to properly align and define relationships. Another way I wrote it down is this, is everybody is imperfect, but that doesn't mean somebody's imperfection, you should allow their immaturity. All of us are imperfect, but not all of us are immature. And so conversation will reveal whether somebody is just being imperfect and we have a mistake and we make mistakes or if somebody is completely immature. So we're defining and discerning whether somebody is imperfect, immature, or watch this, immoral. Imperfect, immature, or immoral. Um, Mark 4.24, Jesus says this. Then he had to pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you'll be given. We have to learn how to listen because hearing is a courtesy but listening is a compliment. I have a whole story I could use, but I think we can keep moving on. I think I drew the point home. Okay. All right, so we've got advocation, then we've got conversation, and next we're gonna go to limitation. Okay, and I, I love what Devin said is, you know, we need to, as Christian, as Christ followers, we absolutely need to love everyone biblically. Everyone deserves my love and my prayers, but they don't all deserve my time. So how do you figure out how to limit the wrong kind of people. And so I want to look at um, Matthew 7 verses 1 through 5. It's, um, we're going to look at verse 6 in just a second, but it, that's the, the verse that everybody knows, you know, well, oh, you know, you got to take the plank out of your own eye before you can look at the speck in somebody else's eye, okay? It's, if you just looked at verses 1 through 5, you could label that as, it could be mislabeled as only don't be judgmental. But then verse 6 is in there, and verse 6 says, um, it says, don't cast your pearls. Pearls represents certain things that are very important to you, precious, precious to you. Yes. So don't cast your pearls before dogs or swine. Swine is unclean things because they could trample your pearl under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. So verse six tells us that, okay, one through five tells us not to be hypercritical and judgmental. But verse six tells us we need to be discerning. There are certain people that you don't cast your pearls in front of, and those are the people that you need to limit your interactions with. And right. even if this is, even if it's family. So let me tell you a, a quick little story about my youth pastor growing up. Amazing, one of the most godly men I know. Um, and he had a father who was very toxic. And so his father kind of was, was spewing some toxicity on his wife, on, on the father's daughter-in-law. And it was just not a good situation. And so my youth pastor um, had a talk. He, he went through these steps, you know, he advocated for, him, for himself. He had a conversation, a tough conversation. It's not comfortable having to have that conversation, but it's necessary. Um, 
has the conversation with his father and, and the father wouldn't relent, wouldn't apologize, wouldn't humble himself. And so he had to actually say, dad, if you don't apologize to my wife and if you keep speaking to her like that, you will not see us until you do that. Wow. And literally he didn't see his father for seven years. Wow. So he was willing to, to put into place like, I'm not going to have anything to do with, you know, I, I'm going to protect my family. He was, he is held responsible for his family. Like just what Joab was saying, Joab was mad at David. Like all these other men are protecting your lineage and your kingdom and your family. And you're not even protecting them. So, so like my youth pastor wow. protected his family from toxicity, even if it was his own blood family. Wow. So it's so important. We got to know, we got to discern between who are the wise, the foolish, and the evil. And those are the people that would correlate with present, distant, and absent. So yeah. it's so important. We got to limit, limit the, the evil people. Yeah, limitation. That's, so, that's such a powerful story. My mom. I didn't even know yeah. that. Um, so you got avocation, conversation, limitation. This is all a chronological step in order. Right. The last thing would be this. If they've gone through these three tests, and based on the information that you have, the fourth step would be elimination. Now, here's what this does not mean as well. This does not mean you're killing them. <laughs> this, no, this that is, kind of elimination. We're speaking metaphorically and Just principally <laughs> and relationally, not physically. This does not mean eliminate them like, you know, hire somebody and it's... <laughs> You know, that's not what we mean. Although you'd like to, I'm sure, sometimes. <laughs> but then are you an evil person yourself? No, I'm just kidding. Go Probably. Ahead. <laughs> elimination. Some people need to be repositioned and some people need to be removed. Mm -hmm. So that's elimination, good. we have to identify the fruits of their life. Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 3, verse 8 says this, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, repentance has fruit. Another that's way you can good. say it is we're not looking just for remorse. We're looking for reform, a.k.a. change. There needs to be change as you have opportunities and conversations. And if right. fruit is not produced in repentance, then there needs to be elimination or removal or repositioning of your relationship with them. Absolutely. This is incredibly biblical. I'll give you another scripture just so you don't think I'm isolating one scripture. Luke 13, 6-9. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Jesus is having a conversation. He says this, um, Starting in verse 7. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. I haven't found any. Cut it down. So why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man said, leave it alone for just one more year. He's literally begging. Don't, don't do that. Don't cut it down. Just leave it for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next time, fine. If not, then you cut it down. God is looking for fruitfulness. He's showing us a model. This is a yeah. parable. He's showing us a model. If people aren't producing fruit, the fruits of repentance, remove yourself from them. It's not that you are removing themselves because you hate them. It's because you love you and you love your calling and you love your family and you love to make sure your heart is protected. That's real love. That's real protection. You were talking about that story with, with uh, your youth pastor. That is not being selfish. That is being a protector of your family. Absolutely. And a good steward. It's, yeah. a, it's great stewardship, but it's hard work. And so I think people yeah. are so poorly taught in this or not taught at all in these areas. I, we, you're not a blame thrower. You have to take responsibility for your life, specifically relationally. My mom said this last week. If you want to live peaceably, you have to handle toxic people or blame throwers responsibly. Yeah. So we have to monitor how we're handling our relationships. Um, I wrote down a few things. You know, look down, look at their what you're looking for and having conversations. And if they're up for elim elimination or repositioning, you're looking for their values, their vices, and their vision. Their values, what do they believe? Mm -hmm. Their vices is, you know, what are some of their insecure? What are some of these toxic patterns? And can I live with that or not? Or should I distance myself because of those vices? What I wrote down is relationships are never broken. The people in those relationships are. Relationships are never broken. It's the people in the relationships that are broken. And their brokenness can lead to our brokenness if we don't steward it properly. And then vision. Um, there's this, uh, I have a friend. Uh, he actually uh, is one of my best friends. He comes to this church. His name is DJ. DJ brings over this, uh, he calls it a virtual reality headset. And so he brings this over to our house. I basically put on these goggles, right? So I put on these goggles and I'm in my living room. But I see completely different things than everybody else sees because now I have a different eyesight, I have different eyes. So I'm in this virtual reality world. We're playing like, 
We're playing like, it's basically like Guitar Hero, but with swords. So I'm, I'm playing Guitar Hero with these swords. It's ridiculous. We're playing this huge game where I'm this giant floating head and I have to dodge people who are shooting bullets at me. It's just the most insane thing on the planet. And so watch this. What I thought about in that moment was uh, we have four or five people in this living room. I have three of my buddies, they're all watching me, you know, we're competing against each other. But everybody is in the same room, but everybody sees different things. So important, yeah. you get that. I literally have different eyes on. I see in a different way. And fundamentally, that is what we're trying to help you accomplish. Is that because I have eyes, and I pray that God opens your spiritual eyes. Yeah. I pray that he opens divine eyes for you. That you are able to see relationships differently. That you have vision for your life. That you know God has put an assignment and a calling on your life to accomplish His purposes on this planet. And the way you can do that is you have to align and define your relationships properly. And if your relationships aren't aligned, I mean that's what our car does is it's out of alignment. It can, it derails you. It can make you go off course. And that's why it's so important when we're stewards of our own lives and we're going to answer to our Heavenly Father ultimately for our lives, I can't blame it on somebody else that, well, they just weren't in alignment with me. I have to either align it or define it. Mm. I just think about in this story, could you imagine, as we close, could you imagine what if David didn't have Joab? What if he didn't have a Joab speaking into his life, privately going to him and saying, David, what the entire camp, what all of our kingdom feels right now because of your emotions and because of your remorse, it feels like you've abandoned us when we sacrificed ourselves for you. Mm -hmm. You hate those who love you and you love those who hate you. That doesn't make sense, David. And I think about this. If David didn't heed this counsel, listen to me. I think this message is so important. We don't just come up here and preach cute little sermons that hopefully your life can get a little bit better. No, this will change everything. Absolutely. This will change generations. This will change legacy 100%. if you put these principles in, in practice. But I think about if David didn't listen to the counsel that Joab gave him. Joab is not a perfect person. Trust me. If you study jo the person of Joab, he is not perfect. But in this moment, he was God-ordained. I think this message is God-ordained for some of you. Absolutely. If you don't heed this counsel, if David didn't heed that counsel from Joab, he would have lost a lot more than just one son. He would have lost his kingdom. He would have lost his legacy. He would have lost all of his, his influence and respect. He would have lost uh, the throne. He would have lost his family because he didn't have counsel like this. And I just think for all of us, we should, we should be monitoring that ourselves. Mm -hmm. Is how do I put these things into practice? How do I learn how to advocate for myself? Maybe you need to have a conversation. Get into one of your small groups. Talk to some of the, for some of my CLA students. Talk to some of the people in our small groups. Okay. You need to learn how to advocate for yourself. You need to learn how to have conversations. Mm -hmm. Have conversations and you're collecting information. Don't just look for people. Learn from David. Don't just look at people for who they could be one day. You have to look at the fruit of their lives. Are they keeping with the fruits of repentance? Do they showcase their beliefs often? And when you see a person for the first time, believe them. And then obviously there's limitations. And then lastly, there would be eliminations. How can you put these things into practice? I'm telling you, it will change your legacy. Yeah. But I pray, and this is what I want to pray for you now. I pray that God would open your spiritual eyes. Yeah. That literally you like put on a headset, that you're in a virtual reality, a spiritual reality. And now I see everything completely different where I see somebody that actually I should probably bring closer and not distance. I see somebody that, <laughs> I see some areas that are toxic. I see some areas that we need to have some conversations. We are not advocating to eliminate everybody. That's not what right. we're saying at all. But you need, do need to align and define all of your relationships and look at them in a fundamentally different way. I wanna pray for you right now. So Father, I pray that as we've taught this content for the past three weeks, with the relationship with ourselves, a relationship with other people, toxic people, a relationship with our families. Help us, Lord, to properly navigate and put on your eyes. Give us your wisdom. Give us your insight to be able to say, to see who's a friend and maybe who's an enemy. Help us to see who is uh, immature, imperfect, or maybe even immoral. Help us to align and define our relationships properly, to be able to discern, is this person supposed to be with me for the rest of my life? Is this, is this the person I'm supposed to marry? Is this, is this my best friend truly? Is there, are there motives? 
uh, different from mine? What are their values? What are their vices? Help us not to be judgmental, Father. We do not want to be judgmental, yes. but we want to be great stewards for our own lives. I pray, Father, that like Joab did, I pray that this message would serve that purpose. And for the king and the queen inside of all the people that are watching right now, I pray that they would listen and heed the counsel of this message, heed the counsel of this scripture, that we'd be able to properly define our family relationships. I know a lot of us have some family drama and family struggles right now. Father, would you mend, would you, would you mold, would you heal, would you reconcile our relationships? I pray that you give wisdom, strategy, insight, words to say, things to do, people to forgive. Help us, Lord, to be released right now in Jesus' name. Now with every head bowed and eye closed still, if you're watching online in the chat, I ask that you listen to me. I think the most key relationship in all of our lives would be Jesus, our relationship with our Heavenly Father. If you really want to win in life, first of all, you have to have eternal security. You have to know where you're going. But you don't just need a savior, you also need an example. You need a father, you need a friend, and that's who Jesus is, he's all encapsulated. He is the Prince of Peace, he's the mighty God, he is the wonderful counselor, he's our savior and our Lord. And I think the relationship you really need to align and define the best is your relationship with God. We can talk about relationships with people here on earth all day, because there's problems, there's issues, there's troubles, there's drama, there's strife, there's all that. But I just pray, that your relationship with God will first and foremost be put into practice and put into place. Yes. And so now I'm going to ask on the count of three, would you just click a button below? Would you acknowledge that you want to give your life to Christ? That's the real relationship that you need alignment on. And so on three, I just ask that you click that button. You would talk to somebody. But one, Jesus loves you. He died for you. Two, today's your day for salvation. Please don't wait another minute. Tomorrow is not promised. Three, if that's you, would you acknowledge and tell somebody you can send a text message to 97,000, uh, CC saved to 97,000. We want to connect with you. We want to help you in this journey. I'm telling you, it would change your life. When I gave my life to Jesus, my nature changed, my life changed. And then I found the right relationships. Life has never been the same. He wants you to go to heaven, but he also wants you to live heaven on earth. And how do you do that? You do that relationally, first with your relationship with God, but also your relationship with others. We pray this message impacted you. Mom, you want to encourage them? Yeah, we love y'all so much. I just encourage you to, if your heart was touched in this, you know, uh, let us know in the chat. But also, don't take another minute to determine I'm going to do something about these Good. relationships that I need to align and define. And we're just praying, continually praying for you that you will have the wisdom and the knowledge and the discernment how to move forward in your relationships. We love y'all. God bless you. And have a great week. God bless you.